Hello and welcome to this uh, webinar, Physical Testing of Quick Connection Systems for Floating Renewables. I'm Chris Eons, committee member of RD Maritime Branch, and together with uh, John Butler, we are delighted here to introduce today's speaker, Nigel Robinson, Sustainable Energy Director at Apollo Offshore Engineering. As Apollo's Sustainable Energy Director, Nigel Robinson heads up a portfolio of engineering services across wind, wave, tidal, and hydrogen services. Nigel's career is um, experience encompasses technical and commercial leadership roles in the UK and overseas. As a practicing engineer, he has supported a broad range of offshore structures and floating assets, always from a maritime perspective. In recent years, he has become increasingly involved with offshore renewables, including the development of Apollo's PAM quick connection system. In line with Apollo's motto, Nigel is very much passionate about engineering and even more so about sustainable energy future. Before I hand over to Nigel, um, a note about the format of today's lecture. This presentation will last uh, 30 to 45 minutes and followed by a Q&A session using slido.com with the hashtag quick. Um, please do make use of this throughout the presentation to post questions and at the end, um, myself and John will do our best to get through as many as possible. Thank you and I will now hand over to Nigel. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you, uh, John, and good evening, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Delighted if you've been able to join in and uh, catch this talk. So it's uh, I've attended a few Aberdeen Maritime Branch, well, quite a lot of them over the years, and uh, I've always enjoyed the evening. So um, I'm hoping that uh, you'll get a lot out of what I'm about to present. But uh, it would be even nicer if it was possible to have a cup of tea and a natter afterwards with you. But hopefully we'll get back to that kind of working arrangement before too long. Um, so uh, I'm going to, yeah, as, as Chris says, I'm talking about the PAM, we call it the PAM, which is, uh, let me just, this device here, which is a quick connection system for floating renewables for the moorings and the electrical cables. Uh, you can see it, it's, uh, it's, it's a simple, fairly simple in concept device. It's got a, a, a plug element underneath docking with a receptacle which gimbals off the, the floating hull. You've got a mooring system, you've got a cable system, and, and they're the main elements of what the PAM is, is. So what I want to do is I want to talk about how we came to getting onto this. We're an engineering company, so uh, it's unusual for us to spend time uh, designing a product, but uh, we've been doing that for two and a half, nearly three years now. Um, then a bit about the design evolution, but what I really want to talk about today, because this is a, a maritime evening, is the physical testing, and uh, the physical testing has involved some in-water testing, which is preceded by work in the lab and work in the workshop. When I say workshop, we're talking a fabrication workshop, so pretty big stuff, uh, but it's been a real fascinating uh, journey to get to this point uh, through lots of stages and uh, tell you a bit about what we've learned along the way. and. Uh, Looking forward to your feedback and comments and questions afterwards, and uh, tell you a bit about where we think we're going with this next status and next steps. So uh, first question is, going on to the origins, why quick connection systems? So there's different, different rationales, whether you're thinking of floating offshore wind or marine energy, starting with floating offshore wind, which is uh, the, the, it's the big one in the news, if you like, uh, more than anything. Um, when you're the offshore wind structures, you'll be no doubt most of you'll be aware that when you're putting an offshore wind turbine generator onto a fixed structure, they put in the, the jacket or the monopile first, it's put in place, and then they come along with a, a crane vessel, typically a jack up unit, and then it lifts on the tower and the, the cells and the various parts of the turbine one by one. Uh, and, and that's how they develop the field. Um, floating offshore wind is relatively uh, underdeveloped is our new technology, and uh, the, there's a different approach that's required. And uh, what you see here in this schematic, which I, I was uh, working on last night, and I'm very proud of it. Um, you've got a floating hull. Uh, you are trying to bring a crane vessel along to lift on uh, and a tower and a cell, maybe as a whole unit. You get a lot of uh, relative motions. The hull is floating. The crane vessel is probably floating because of the water depth. Uh, you got uh, long lever arms, you have operability questions, apart from which the actual hook height is pretty, pretty high up there. And, uh, and, and may, there may only be a few crane vessels that can deal with it. So um, the availability, there's cost, the commercial arguments that kind of stack up in favor towards the idea that you assemble this inshore, you tow the whole assembly out uh, to field as a completed unit. And that's what's been done in uh, several cases uh, thus far. Uh, but then the question is, what about maintenance? Uh, typically, uh, offshore wind 
turbine generators need a bit of maintenance, what are you going to do to get the, the uh, gearboxes out of the, the nacelles and take them to shore? And, and the, the base case that people talk about is taking the whole system back to shore. So now it would be pretty obvious as a, to a maritime audience that uh, we've got mooring operations, we've got cable operations, we've got towage operations, there's marine spreads, there's vessels. It quickly adds up as quite a cost and, and it's an interruption as well. So all the time you want to be producing electricity. And uh, so that's not happening. So if you want to if you want to read more about it, there's a carbon trust report that I've got in the, the corner there, um, which uh, explains explains why people are going to quick connection systems. It's not the end product. A lot of people question whether that that is going to be the way people will work in the future. But there's not much time to get all this sorted before, say, Scott Wind is supposed to go live in 2030. So um, this is the base case: is to tow the whole thing to shore. So if you're doing that there is a real advantage of a quick connection system. Uh, so just a wee bird about the mooring and cable connect disconnect operations. So the moorings might be on the left-hand side here. Typically, if you're working in moorings, you'll know there's a pre probably a pre-laid mooring system of some kind. You tow the assembly along. There's a, a hookup operation with back deck, operation, uh, back deck handling and so forth, as you see some of the images there. On the right-hand side, the, the cable installation well, the cables, uh, there's a lot of cables in offshore wind and uh, the specialist crane vessels like the, the Endurance, which I saw around in Clipper Key one night, uh, would deploy the cables from one end, one turbine to the other, and there'd be a kind of complex pull-in operation uh, to complete the operation and dock the cable protection system and, and its latch. So all of that is quite complicated operations, quite, quite elaborate vessels, um, high-spec vessels. The alternative, uh, quick connection system. So the idea here is that you have some kind of arrangement like on the right-hand side where you may have, for example, a, a pre-installed submerged node with a mooring system and cable hanging off it, which is buoyed off. You tow along the hull. There's a, an operation to connect the two things. And uh, so disconnection is equally simple. So you can see, I think you can see intuitively how this uh, this uh, makes makes sense and it's attractive. but what does a quick connection system look like and how do you make that reliable in the marine environment? So um, the, the left-hand side is a conceptual uh, stack up of costs. It may be more expensive to have a, a pre-installed mode uh, node of some kind, a pre-laid pre mooring, but you quickly save. You're doing mooring and cable operations at the same time, for example. Uh, you, If you can do it without uh, fancy ROVs, hydraulics, electrical servos, whatever, you can save more costs. If you avoid personal transfer, you can save again and, and keeping the main marine spread to a minimum is a big prize if you could just use standard vessels. So this is all the rationale behind the use of the quick connection systems that we've been uh, working with. Uh, on the wave energy side, they're also very interested in this and there's slightly different drivers because they're not looking at high hook, hook heights and so on, but they still want to uh, find ways of making quick connections. So this is a uh, plug for Chris. Uh, this is maybe one of your, 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 this is one of your designs, maybe one of your uh, drawings, I don't know. But um, there's a system here which looks a bit like what I just showed you. It's a mooring system, there's a cable system, and there's a prime opportunity to um, make a, a quick connection system under the hull there. And, and when you've got likes of a marine energy, which is a relatively frontier technology, um, you probably will have to intervene a bit more than you would on a long-term established technology. So uh, being able to connect, disconnect has, has its own drivers. And that's where we came to, that's how we came to this uh, whole um, project. It was through Wave Energy and Wave Energy Scotland's uh, Quick Connection Programme. So just a word about that. The Quick Connection program is has been running for a few years. It's one of a series of technology uh, programs that Wave Energy Scotland have been promoting. Uh, on one hand, they're promoting the development of novel wave energy converters, but at the same time, they've got identified key technologies which can reduce cost uh, or, or de-risk the project, I should say. Not the wrong cost is not the answer, is de-risk the project. So one of these was quick connection systems for the reasons I just said. So these, uh, these projects have been running in parallel. And the idea is that there's a cross fertilization between the wave energy devices and these subsystems to ultimately come up with a, a robust and, and good solution. So where we are in the whole program is towards the right hand side of this, uh, this diagram. And that's what I'm going to tell you a bit more about the highlighted red item there. Okay, so uh, that's, that's the origins of uh, where we're going. Excuse me a second. Um, the next thing is how what did we how did we approach this? So we we thought we had something to 
to say we had been working with quick connection systems and various solution uh, devices, uh, supporting clients and so on. Uh, but we thought we might have an idea that would help here. And so th this was uh, literally one Friday night sitting with a sketchbook and thinking, what would a quick connection system look like for a wave energy device? So I was coming from various, various uh, trains of thought here. Um, one of them was oh, a floating wave energy device might be a bit like an FPSO. And we know that FPSOs have, have had integrity challenges with, uh, with mooring systems, a lot of work by the likes of Martin Brown and Andrew Comley and others who have, uh, who have spent a lot of time researching that area. Can, that, can the learning from that be incorporated into something for wave energy devices, which are going to have to deal with pretty aggressive uh, marine environments and, and, and provide moorings, but also electrical connection there. So but working off, say, a hose pipe seemed a good idea. Um, on the right-hand side, this is the, the Magen project up in Pendlin Firth, which is a tidal stream device. And in this, the, the tidal uh, turbine has to dock on a gravity-based structure underwater and make a quick connection in very short space of time. You're working between tides. So um, that's that's like a, of a, a 20 minute, 30 minute operation. So they had uh, developed a way of making it a mechanical connection at the same time as an electrical connection for their turbine. So maybe there's some inspiration we could take there. And the other area I was, I was also looking at a couple of other areas. One of them was the, the ICDAM project, the TCMS. Some of you may remember that. Um, which had this sort of complex riser. I was thinking, well, you've got cables and you've got chains all rising up through to a node. So we sketched it, I sketched it all up and put it into this drawing here, where the idea is this. You have a, a hose pipe kind of arrangement hanging off the hull. By the action of a tug's winch, you pull uh, the node up into a guide system that completes a mechanical and electrical docking at the same time. Uh, and that's it. So it's a pre-installed mooring, a pre-installed cable, and uh, and so that that was the idea. Uh, took it to the designers on Monday, and they did a much better job of it. And then we applied for the competition and got onto it. So uh, they obviously liked um, liked the idea that we were starting with. So that that's where it came it came from. It was drawing very much on industry experience and trying to get this integrity question into the whole design. We wanted things that would last, and we know how challenging the marine environment is. So it has to be structurally strong, marinized. I'm trying to avoid sophisticated uh, servers, servos and, and control systems and so on that might not have that long-term integrity. So that was the idea. We just use a good old agricultural pull in a tug's winch, make the connection, job done. Want to disconnect it, it's something similar. Now, in this sketch, there's a few details that are not worked out on how to make that work, but we had a, a bit of funding to get to the bottom of those. Okay, so moving on, uh, we, the objectives we had in summary, we want to obviously has to work, maintain station, it has to work in operational and survival conditions, so it's seeing out the worst of the weather. It has to be reliable, repeatable uh, electrical connection, that has to be, that's an essential part. We want to minimize risk to personnel in doing this, avoid uh, impact on the energy capture, so whatever we design shouldn't really impede the wave energy device's performance. Uh, minimizing time on site, keep the vessel, vessel cost down, marine spread cost down, keeping the productive time up. Uh, avoid specialist vessels. So, you know, as soon as you get into complicated vessels, then you add a lot of cost. As I say, avoid the hydraulics, avoid the actuators, be marinized rugged, and provide long term integrity. So, easy. Eh? Uh, so, that was the challenge we set ourselves and uh, we went about it. So, there was a three stage program. Stage one, uh, each stage, it was a competition. So you, you did stage one, it was down seven, seven parties got on stage one. Then I think it was four got on stage two and then three have gone forward in stage three. Um, so each one was a competition and each stage you're getting more and more into the depth of the design. Uh, first of all, it's pretty much a geometric design, work out the design basis, methodology, some high level costs. And from that sketch, we end up with the, the kind of diagram you see here. And you can see actually how the design has evolved through the different stages just from these pictures. Um, so that, that one in the bottom left, we've found a way that if you just pull in the wire, um, the plug, which is a bit that is drawn up into the receptacle, uh, makes a connection just with the pull. And then if you pull again, it makes a disconnection. The nearest analogy I can think of is a ball, clicky ballpoint pen. Uh, so, oh, I've got one here. Um, so click on, click off, uh, and, and that's a connection made disconnected. Obviously, much bigger, a lot more, a slower operation, but fundamentally, it's got similarities. 
Uh, the stage two was when we got really into the engineering. And for that, we were challenged to work with two test case wave energy converters. So uh, Motion Energy were very kind and uh, supported us with information about their Blue X device. And the other party was Carnegie Clean Energy who, uh, with their CETO 6 device. So we, we were getting into the engineering of adapting this concept to work with those devices in principle. So it's geometric and engineering design, uh, methodology, risk assessment, design risk, as well as HIRA, uh, cost modeling and commercialization. So completed that, and then we can see that the device is starting to shape up as something that's quite credible. Uh, and then into stage three is the physical testing. And physical testing is to prove it in a representative environment, in this case, the marine environment, and do a commercialization study. And we are just at the end of that stage now. So the, this summer, we spent uh, quite a lot of time doing uh, testing. And that's I've got a nice slideshow to take you through at the end of that. Okay, what's next? So uh, yeah, so at this stage, at the end of stage two, we'd actually looked at quite a few different permutations. So uh, this is the, the motion uh, energy one on the left. It's, uh, I believe it's three kilowatts. Uh, of course, you can keep me straight on that, but the mooring tension, we're working with 25 ton mooring tension. So it's, uh, it's, it's orders of magnitude, an order of magnitude below what you might say, see in a semi-sub. Uh, but, First of all, is to design something for that. The one to beside that is the CETO6, the clean energy one. This is an interesting concept. It's a wee bit spacey looking, but uh, the hull is a large submerged hull with a variable geometry mooring. And it's a bit like a seat belt as you pull in. As the hull moves around, it pulls in and adjusts the length of the, the mooring cable, and that generates the power. So in that one, we turned to develop a mechanical only solution and stuck it down in the seabed. But the design tension now is 800 tons. So we're working from 25 tons up to 800 tons. And being able to, we were able to demonstrate the engineering uh, strength design quite, quite simply for, uh, for both applications. We also got a bit of funding from Offshore Wind Growth Partnership. Uh, we thought this would be interesting for floating offshore wind. And so float, floating um, power plant let us have information about their device. And that's a, that's a much bigger animal itself, is 18,000 ton hull. Uh, so again, it was a single point mooring in that, uh, that configuration. We're up at uh, over a thousand ton tension, design tensions. So uh, it's, the scale is quite, quite wide ranging. And during, during that, we developed all sorts of ideas. Um, we had this, this one on the right, which is a, a sketch of something that might sit on top of anchor piles for an array scale deployment. You have three connectors upside down, if you like. Uh, all uh, joining to one anchor pile that might work in an array. So, so that's less developed, but the, the three on the left, we went into quite a lot of detail in, in terms of uh, engineering feed. Um, yeah, oh, right. So at this point, uh, it's a bit of light relief. I thought I'd show you um, a video that we prepared at the end of stage two to, to show what we were thinking. And uh, what you can see here is the motion energy device, uh, which has got a pre-installed receptacle hanging off the bottom of it. And it's to attach to a, um, a pre-installed mooring system, which is a two-leg mooring with uh, midline buoys. So I'll just show you this in operation. Hopefully you can see this moving on your screens. Uh, if, uh, if not, then I can check my chat just to see that nothing is uh, frozen. Is that working? Yeah. Okay, so have I just frozen this? Yeah, there we are. So in this, uh, the tug, there's been an operation to connect the winch work wire, which passes through the hull, through the receptacle, down to the pre-installed plug. That's all been hooked up. If in the words of Blue Peter, this is something that we prepared earlier. And, and what's happening here is the tug has to winch in and the plug will come up into the receptacle. Now, you might have noticed that the, there's no reaction point for the, between the tug and the the wave energy converter in this, uh, in this arrangement. It's just shown that way for... Uh, for clarity. In practice, the tug would be bearing against the, the hull. So it's just pulled up the plug into the receptacle, and that's a magic sauce happened. This is a bit more detail about it, and what you've got in the inside, and this is it's quite an early configuration actually, but it's principles the same. It's a guide system that orientates the plug, puts the plug into just the right place, so as you let the tension off the, off the work wire, you make the electrical connection, and that's it happened. You just made an electrical and mechanical connection uh, with that, that particular operation there. So as I say, it's a pull in in the wire and then you release it, drops into the lock position. When you come to want to disconnect, you pull again in the wire, it goes through a different track and it drops out again. So in this, 
there's a, a clockwise rotation all the time, and that's quite important uh, when I talk about the, the testing, because um, that, that appears as a feature. But the plug will come up, rotate, drop down, come up, rotate again in the same direction, drop out. And, and so that's the idea. It's got 120 degree symmetry and stuff like that. Uh, but and I say the, the guide system has greatly evolved from there, but that's fundamentally the idea of the palm, pull and lock marine connector. Um, okay. So, uh, no, I don't want to do that again. Let's go down, page down. In terms of cost, uh, technically, we were getting a lot of confidence at this stage. In terms of cost, uh, would it save money? And, and yeah, we believe it does. When you, the main saving is on the boat time. So if in a conventional approach, like sketched out at the beginning, you'd have anchor handlers. Uh, you'd also have, when it came to disconnecting, you might, need a crane vessel, a 400 ton crane vessel, whatever it is for, um, for the cable to drop out and be put into a safe place, adds up as a cost. And, uh, but if you use the PAM, you're doing everything with basically anchor handlers, Not, nothing special, just anchor, hand, anchor handlers, that's all you need. So there's a saving on uh, the vessel costs, significant saving in vessel costs, but also it's quicker. You, the operation that might have taken two days takes one day because you're doing both moorings and, and cables at the same time. So as I say, it takes a little longer to set up, but uh, the, the number of interventions you need through the life of the field quickly adds up. This is a pretty conceptual LCOE calculation. We've got, got into a lot more detail uh, if needed, but um, you know, when needed, but uh, that, that's just for illustration really. Okay, so this is the basis on which we applied for stage three, and it takes us to physical testing. And so this is what I'd like to just run through now really with you. Um, this is not a stage picture. This is completely natural. We're down in uh, Hall's Quay in, uh, in Aberdeen Harbour, North Harbour, where we chartered a boat and put this whole thing to work. Uh, you see here two, two of the key people in the project. Stephen Malloy has been the project engineer. And Stephen Vorley uh, was uh, helping us a lot in the marine uh, the marine preparedness. And, and that was something that we realized that we needed to put a lot more effort into marine readiness uh, than perhaps we had appreciated from a design perspective. The other uh, key person in this is Nick Reynolds, who has been the, the graphical designer all the way through this and has come up with some amazing solutions. So I uh, just wanted to mention them. Okay, so going into stage three. Stage three was, uh, as I say, was uh, um, a three-point test program. Uh, so first of all, we start in the laboratory, then we go into workshop uh, onshore, and then we go into field testing. And what we're trying to do at all times is move up the technology readiness curve, uh, because what we need to be is to get to get this to market, we need to be up at TRL 8.9, ready to uh, for people to invest and have the confidence to invest. So at stage one, we, we were stage one, we were TRL one. Um, at the end of stage one, we we're still only TRL one, two. At the end of stage two, which is the feed engineering design, but yeah, okay, two, three, but we had quite, we had still quite a long way to go, but the physical testing program moves you through the stages. So the first thing we did was take all the learning from all these cases and, and cross-fertilize from likes of the Offshore Wind Growth Partnership and to the Wave Energy Scotland projects and back, uh, backwards and forwards to come up with the design that you see on the right. So it's, it's starting to look much more like a, a product, I think. Um, so you, you've got the, still got the receptacle, you still got the plug. Um, we wanted to, we would just test the mechanical uh, or mechanical function of this. We weren't setting out to develop an electrical connector. That's, that's a very specialist thing that people do. What we want to do is make something that connects pro, uh, um, commercially available electrical connectors. So where, where you ever, wherever you go for the electrical connector, the palm has to bring these parts together in the marine environment. That's the challenge. So we've got, still got the receptacle. It's still gimbaled at the top. There's a track you could probably just about make out in there through the gaps. And then the plug is underneath. Um, because We simulated the all the mechanical parts. We simulated the um, the shape of the mechanical docking. And, the, and this is this inset here where uh, there's all the fine engineering, if you like, to make the electrical connections. The electrical connectors are 3D printed dummy components, um, but everything else is is real. So we've got like sort of floating plates and bases and so on to allow everything just to rattle into place and stabbing plates and so on. So that was, a, that was fine engineering in the middle of a, something that's intended to work agriculturally, if you like, or very, very roughly. So um, you start with something that's rough, rugged, moves everything into a more controlled position, and then you make this fine connection. And that's what you have to be able to do in this. 
uh, it's um, yeah, the, the the fine engineering part came as a, a, a revolution. Uh, sorry, a, it, it revealed itself through the project. Uh, down the bottom in the plug, it's a mechanical in the plug, so there's no cable coming off it, and we've got the simplest of mooring systems, which is just a simple shackle with uh, which will have a wire or chain hanging off the bottom. Uh, we separated out the guide parts, which are at the top here, from the load bearing parts. So the guides move it through the right place, and the load bearing parts land in the right place. And these had to be outboard of any swivel, which is one thing that uh, the mooring integrity report had uh, talked about. Uh, and then you could just see the electrical connection parts underneath the guides. The guides were 3D printed. So we started to experiment with that. And we were satisfied that they had the strength to withstand the loads. Um, so th there was some learning about that. But this is, this is what we're working off here. Uh, first stage was this laboratory test. And this is an image from the laboratory test. Uh, we went to someone who had worked with quite a lot, uh, Richard Hay of WWW Engineering Design, who's a very, very helpful guy with uh, an amazing number of strings to his bow. And he printed up a, a scale model version of the device, which you can see here. Uh, I've got to keep moving my own picture around the screen here. Excuse me a second. Um, yeah, so it's an eighth, eighth scale of what we were actually going to end up building in 3D printing. And it was to really sort of take out any residual design concerns that just weren't working right. Um, he set it up in a rig and you can see him sitting back and this is working remotely with 100% reliability. It's just pulling in, he's got a thread at the top, you pull on it, uh, it connects, in fact, I have it here. Do I dare try it? Um, this, is the, this is the device here. So the mooring's underneath and it was, uh, that's it, that's it disconnecting. And then you just pull in this thread and that's it connected. And it's as simple as that. So he had that happening on a winch. Um, oh, sorry, in a, a remote control winch, and it, it's perfectly reliable. So we thought we'd got that right as far as we can uh, do it. And at the end of that, we, we're reaching TRL 3.4, which means we're, it's repeatable, it's stable performance, and it's in a lab environment, stands to reason. Uh, so from there, we went on to, do, to build something a bit bigger, and we engaged our associated company, Global Energy Group, as a parent company, but as an associated branch of it, to, to build this nice big version of the kit that you can see in this picture on the right. Um, when I went around to look at the kit, that wasn't in that place there. And I don't know if you can see in the background, there's a big white thing. I nearly passed out when I saw it because that's what I thought I'd, <laughs> I'd just spent money on was buying something that scale. I thought it's, it's a bit big. Uh, but no, we're working with this thing here, which is a receptacle supported on a frame. And then we have a plug arrangement that has to be pulled in, which is not particularly visible. You can see the parts of the plug in the top left. So it's coming together. It's a lot of moving parts, or a lot of parts to be assembled, actually, by this stage. It just shows from a simple idea, things build up pretty quickly. Beautiful fabrication job. The welds are immaculate. Everything was uh, just so, and the tolerances are just spot on. So really, really pleased. Um, the bottom left, you can see the 3D printed parts. Uh, Angus 3D did that for us. So some fairly hefty bits of kit. Some of them, the, the shapes, are the, the sort of pointed shapes are guides, and then there's in the someone's hand here is the 3D printed uh, electrical wet mate connector simulator, right? So we've got those parts in there as well. Pretty tough bits of kit. Uh, we also decided to instrument the hell out of it, uh, if pardon, excuse uh, the term, but uh, we put uh, proximity sensors and strain gauges and running load monitors and so on all over this because we really we saw this as a unique opportunity to to find out everything we possibly could uh, about how this is working. Still, bear in mind, we still haven't uh, achieved a full connection by this stage. So there's quite a lot of commitment. During this time, uh, the price of steel went through the roof uh, because of uh, Ukraine, the situation in Ukraine. Um, but fortunately, we had just got the contingencies just about right to allow us to, to get this done. But that, we were, I think we budgeted on £7,500 per Tad of steel and uh, fabricated steel, and it came out uh, near twelve and a half thousand. So it's um, it was quite a steep inflation of one of the highest cost elements in the project. So uh, yeah, okay. So the commodity prices had a quite significant impact on this. Uh, so fabrication workshop testing. The objectives were functionality. Would it work? And would it work? Uh, mis misaligned, as you can see in this picture. So uh, imagine a vessel pitching around. And, being misaligned with the uh, the moorings, could you could you make the connections? Um, 
There was a structural integrity test, uh, which involved hanging 20 tons off a load test. So some big weights in the background somewhere. And then trialing the instrumentation because we wanted the instrumentation, particularly for the field operations. Pleased to say that all tests on short uh, were completed successfully um, over the four day period. It was a great moment when I just looked over and saw the first thing come in, connect, drop down. Because that, that was there was a lot riding on that actually working, uh, and it did. And it was very repeatable, very stable, and TRL4 demonstrated, which is a repeatable, stable performance in a controlled environment. So I think that's a fairly uh, clear description. Two things we noticed at this stage. One of them was uh, torsional buildup in the wire. When this is all perfectly lined up, we could we could pull we could spin the plug with a light touch of your light touch, uh, just turn it one way or the other. Now, if I, you remember, I, I mentioned that this thing has to go up and turn in the same direction each time to go through the tracks. It is relying on gravity to drop into the right track, uh, but we could go up and we could just spin it to the right, at the right time and it would go down the wrong track. So it would come in the in track and go out the on in track if we made it work that way. But we felt that that was very artificial. It was, everything had to be perfectly lined up. Marine environment's not like that. Everything's going to be moving, frictional takeover. <clears throat> and so we decided, convinced ourselves it wouldn't be an issue. The other thing was in this configuration, just about, you can just about make out these guide blocks. They could, there were, were positions where they just hung up on the bell mouth slightly. And again, we thought, well, you know, the, the operational realities um, will will overcome that. And uh, we were quite wrong on both points, uh, as I'll explain in a second. Let's get a glass of water. So we're now to in-water testing. Uh, so we went, there was one month into the next, so we straight into the in-water testing. 10-day um, <clears throat> program in the new port of Aberdeen, South Harbour. So uh, we thought this is a perfect test bed, nice and sheltered, uh, low waves, uh, ironically, but we are testing something. Um, bit of wind, uh, but space for the vessel. And there's not really any other vessels around. This is earlier stage. So uh, we thought that was ideal. What we wanted to do was validate that this works in the water and just also try the marine procedures. The marine procedures in the earlier HIRA work, um, Seacroft had, uh, had pointed out that, the, that there's a lot of handling, there's a lot of back deck operations. This could be uh, quite a, a tricky, tricky thing for us. Uh, in practice, so we wanted to understand more about that, and uh, so that was that was one of our objectives. Uh, well, to give you the answer first, we got full mooring connection disconnection in water, and TRL five was demonstrated, which is technology validated in a relevant environment. However, we learned a lot on the way, and uh, I'll just just go through some of that now. Um, yeah, oh, just on the harbour. So when when subsea seven say that they were the first vessel commercial vessel in the new harbour. We were there a week earlier, and I have the evidence. Um, so <laughs> it was a very small scale operation, but we were there a week earlier, commercial operation. Um, so they, these are some of the storyboards of what we were trying to do. Uh, some beautiful storyboards produced by Nick. Um, some of the nicest ones I've actually seen. Um, nice 3D renderings. This is the frame now hanging over the back as a, as a Lars, basically a launch recovery system. And uh, the gimbal, the uh, receptacle has been dropped into the end of the frame and is partially submerged in the water. Uh, so we set that up that way. So we had to see fasten all that down and so on. Um, take the load back to a winch, um, which the tug's winch up the back there, which is going to do all the operations. And that was, that was one of the things that was different about this and that we're no longer closely doing this where we're standing back and using winches to make everything happen. And you can see the plug there and you can see all the different wires and why uh, handling might have been an issue. Um, so it uh, might have been a concern uh, uh, before we went into that. So um, yeah, as Morris Pickles pointed all that out uh, for us, he helped us on the uh, risk assessments. Um, so there's some of the operations there, uh, a few more. So we've got clump weights, a simple mooring, which is just a wire hanging off a clump weight. Uh, these are shown alongside the key, but we're also out in the open water at times as well. Um, there was different things by using snap shackles. In fact, the whole thing couldn't start till this little device here uh, arrived. So one of the things we learned was procure early to avoid disappointment. Um, be, uh, we didn't order this early enough. We had to wait on this little thing happening. And the first thing that happened, of course, was uh, 
the rigger decided it was not fit for purpose and he wanted to do it a different way. So there we go. Um, lesson learned, shall we say. Uh, so we, we did, there were some late changes. We had a management of change program uh, process to just make sure we're controlling things. But instead of relying on things like snap shackles to put things in the right configuration, just turning things upside down and using the crane and winch in clever ways. Uh, so thank, thank goodness we did have a rigger on board because uh, I think we'd have struggled without one. Uh, vessel selection, we went with the fourth uh, constructor here, uh, workboat from Briggs Marine. Just It's just what we needed, really. It had the space, uh, had a good, decent crane, which had the decent reach. Uh, tugger winch capacity of 10 tons. Uh, sta joystick uh, station keeping. Um, there was space in the bridge to work, which we, we did actually need that. Um, so, you know, there's vessels that we thought of that might not, might not have that with GPS and we needed the under, the under deck beam drawings so we could do sea fastenings. Uh, so that, that turned out to be a good choice of vessel and very, very helpful for Briggs Marine. So thank you to them for that. Uh, we sent, Seacroft went down and did a, a kind of on hire survey, checked it all out. So everything was the way it should be, the certificates and so on, BIMCO contract. So yeah, that all went fine. Uh, though the tugger winch capacity, we, the tug control, the winch control wasn't subtle enough or wasn't, um, it was a bit bang, bang. So we decided to get another winch in and, and, uh, and use that for the, for the test because it had a better control. It's just for the test, when you get bigger, it'll be a bit more anchor handler oriented. Mobilization, not an awful lot to say about the motion mobilization, just some images of it. Two box talks going on on the left, uh, the various team, the, uh, the engineering and the, uh, the crew. Um, the, this is the device that had to be dropped into the um, into the Lars there. So we've got it hanging off a, a, an installation frame, which the whole unit comes out if we needed it, which we did. You can see the plug. You can see the receptacle. Quite a crowded deck in the end of the day, and we kept the uh, kept the container on the shore. But, um, we had an idea of using a container for stowing, but there wasn't space really. So this is all happening in Hull's Key. Uh, some of the controls and instrumentation. You can see here, uh, this is the winch when you've got a load line monitor coming off it. So that was just to see what's happening on line tensions. Um, this is the device in the water. You can see the instrumentation, the bottom right, all the cables that, that set up. Um, so there's a lot of gubbins going on there, but it was nicely tidied away. And the top right is a little app that uh, Richard Hay developed for us. So we could see exactly where the plug was at any one time, little lights come on and off as a thing came in and out. So that was quite useful. I'd, it was coupled to a data logger. Right, so um, functionality. The first thing to test was when you're just using a, a winch or mounted on a tug, pulling one way, pulling the other way, would it connect, would it disconnect? And uh, it would go through the different tracks, drop into position. Could you pull it again, drop out? So this is all done on the key side. And the first answer was no, it didn't, uh, which was a bit of a surprise given all the, the stuff that we had done beforehand. What was happening? Um, and do you remember I mentioned that torsion in the winch wire? Well, what, what was happening was that the plug would come up and this wire did in fact put, put a torsion back on the system. So it became a spring, a torsional spring. And as the plug moved up into the top position, instead of dropping into the, um, into the lock position, it went back out the end track. And so that was, uh, that was a head scratching moment. It turned out it was down to the swivels. We put swivels at the top of the plug. You can see in the left-hand inset, it's a swivel hoist ring, which in the end of the day just had far too much friction. It was also bone dry. There was no grease or anything in it, so that didn't help. So a quick trip to Aberdeen Lifting Services, get some uh, better swivels fit for the task, and that, that kind of sorted out the problem. So, uh, yeah, anxious moment when that happened. It's a few uh, strained faces until it suddenly started happening. And when it happened, it was fine from then on. So <clears throat> Archie the Rigger, who you can see in the middle here, took us through. 11 sequential connect, disconnect, just one after the other, click, click, click. One of the things was to be a bit, not to be too soft and gentle with the controls, but to let it rattle in, rattle out, which is actually the philosophy of it in the first place. Use gravity to your advantage. So we got there, we got the functionality proven and it became a repeatable and reliable thing. So that was good in terms of moving around the track. But the other part of it was to, to pull in the mooring. So have a mooring that was remotely deployed. Um, for that, we had to go into the other harbour, and uh, that was an anxious moment in itself because we realised as this thing was travelling, uh, because the receptacle, you can just make it out in this middle picture, it's gimbaled, 
the risk was it's going to bash against the hull. And uh, uh, so you can see how it's inclined. I was around in Poker Key taking photographs of this, or well, videoing it, actually. And then as I went around Girdlenau's Lighthouse, the whole thing started pitching and moving around. And I thought, oh, gosh, it's either going to be wrecked or it'll be fine. And it turned out to be fine. We put some pads on. You could see they're not even touched. So there was just a good rake on the, on the vessel. Uh, the bit on the left I love because that's uh, marine traffic. And there we are, South Harbour trial on the uh, 12th of June. That's uh, that's ours. <laughs> and that's the evidence that we were in the South Harbour on a commercial job. But you can see the picture at the bottom. It was, it was not pretty weather at all. You can barely see what's happening. Um, functionality too. So this is the test here. We've uh, got simplest of moorings. So it's a club weight. This wire comes up to the plug with this uh, large gray boy. I uh, can't really see the scale, but it's pretty big. And the idea was you put that in place, the boat comes along, grapples the boy, pulls it onto the deck, and then makes the connection with that green line, which you can just see. So the plug is on the green line, the boy's taken off, drop it all off, pull it in, connect. And uh, and that's it working, simples, uh, no problems, uh, was the reality of it. But um, yeah, I'll come into that in a second, but uh, yeah, that, yeah, if it, yeah, okay, sorry, I'll just pass on. Um, so the problems, what were the problems? Well, when we took out that snap shackle, we replaced it with a uh, floating strop and the floating strop um, was used in a place that we didn't expect. The, the management change hadn't picked up that it was in the wrong place. So when we pulled in the first time, the whole thing got fouled up and seized and it seized solid because the forces that were so were so strong that pulled this thing together, you couldn't budge this. Um, and that was, uh, that was quite a uh, bothering moment, to be honest. We were kind of high and dry in the middle of the South Harbour with this thing seized and stuck and a crane attached. So, But we did manage to sever the, the, the offending strop, get back to port, lift the whole thing out and try and pull it out. And this is, a, this is during the uh, removal of the plug. And it wasn't budging. It was all winched up. You can see it tied back. Uh, so if you, these strops here tied back to holding points. The other end is attached to the winch. The winch couldn't budge it. So at this point, the chap in the yellow, that's Lucas, who's the crane operator, marine engineer, and chef, who does a, a wicked uh, scotch broth, actually. He <laughs> came up and said, I know what to do here. And he disappeared down into the kitchen. And he came back with a, bottle, a huge bottle of fairy liquid, and he squirted it all over the whole thing. He said, now try it. And so they tried the winch, and the whole thing stuck, stuck, flew out. So it's, uh, <laughs> if in doubt, brings fairy liquid with you. That's uh, it's the magic ingredient. But we did get a wee bit of uh, damage. You can see in this picture here, the three D printed part was broken with, with the strop. Clearly, the, the the cause of that. But we had already tested that part, so we weren't too worried. What we really wanted to do was make the mooring connection, and that was the next thing. So uh, another management change, another trip to Aberdeen Lifting Services. Put chain underneath instead of soft strop. You can see the swivels there. Go out, drop the whole thing in the harbour, pulled in. It worked, and thank goodness for that. That was the last day we had for testing. Uh, we demonstrated, we got proof of concept. Um, so that was uh, that was good. There was one last last pro difficulty: uh, the positioning of the vessel to get the orientation. You had to be moving forward, so you had to be moving relative to the GBS, and otherwise it couldn't tell what heading it was. And that made just things a wee bit too difficult to to attempt an offshore test. So we decided to quit while we're ahead. Um, complete that operation and uh, yeah, and, and just uh, right up in that point. So as I say, the concept was proven. We did in the end 20, more than 20 underwater pull and drop out operations with high reliability, two full mooring and unmooring operations in sheltered water. We experimented with the rigging, load, learned lots about it, slightly artificial rigging arrangement compared to what we intend to do ultimately. But lots of learning. Um, one of the key learnings was get the right people at the hire, because that thing about the snap shackle, the strop, etc., that could all have been avoided if the right people had been at the hire. But there was late change of people, and, and that they hadn't really been present. The people who were on the job hadn't been present there. So that was quite a thing to think about. Relationship between line torsion and swivel friction is a design issue taking forward, so it's, it's perfectly designable. We just have to be good with it. Uh, the track shape, we can improve the track shape to resist the, uh, to reduce the chance of it going the wrong way. Vessel positioning capability was critical. Uh, could have had subsea cameras, that could have helped. Um, change of the guide funnel geometry to avoid that snagging issue. Uh, the, the breakage of the 3D printed parts, um, material choice for offshore handling, for rough handling. I don't think 3D parts or uh, 3D printing is the way to go for the, the full scale, but it was quite handy for what we were doing. 
no soft strops in uh, pooling areas is uh, definitely something. Uh, and I always have a box of fairy liquid handy just in case. Um, and so that's where we are uh, pretty much there. Um, today, concepts at TRL5, uh, demonstrated in a representative environment. We understand the design potential. We understand the risk profile. There's a patent application in the works, and we've been through some kind of pre-commercial design and testing program. Where we want to go from now, uh, we think go into the extended operations, because what will it do over a period of time? Corrosion risk, wear risk, marine growth, what's that going to do to it? Uh, so we've got that uh, as a project coming together for that. We want to go very big with floating offshore wind, look at 66 kilovolts, because that's what the floating offshore wind device is. Base case, uh, you even talk about 132 kilovolt uh, or interray cables. So we're talking to connector uh, manufacturers for that and then looking at the array deployment as well. Ultimately, we want to be commercially deployable by 2025. So we've moved up to TRL5, got to get to TRL8, 9. So we're looking to work with partners, with people who've got projects that they want to try this out in anger and get we'll, we'll get closer to the solution is and uh, the commercial status. Because there's a big prize at the end of this. It's uh, potentially quite a large opportunity. And just final note, thanks very much to various people who helped us on the way. Wave Energy Scotland, of course. Also Offshore Wind Growth Partnership, Global Energy Group. Um, but uh, Floating Power Plant, Carnegie Clean Energy, Motion Energy, very helpful with uh, sharing information. And a lot of people chipped in and uh, did work on the project at various stages. And uh, so that, that's always appreciated. And uh, it's quite amazing how quickly that, that builds up. And that's it. And this is a, a very happy design and sponsoring and fabrication team after the uh, workshop testing. And that's that's all I've got for, uh, to present. Um, I think I made the 45 minutes pretty much bang on. Uh, very happy to answer any questions if you've got any. Fantastic. Listen, thanks for me for that, Nigel. That was, that was excellent. Um, We've had questions coming through as well throughout the presentation. And uh, whilst we're going through those, I think for everybody else, you should have the link to the Slido. So by all means, feel free to ask other questions as you come along as well. Um, so we'll see if um, if uh, Chris is going to come along. But whilst we're waiting for him, um, first of all, thanks for the presentation. It's brilliant. And what, what I found really interesting is, one of the things I often talk about is the fact that we're, we're, this type of area industry or um, energy industry that we're moving into it's, it's quite frontier like and uh, and the technologies and the innovations that are being developed right now are going to be things that are going to help transform and create efficiencies and 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 make the whole sort of uh, system far more fluid and and uh, and viable and uh, so it's, it's great to see that kind of living breathing type of um of of of, uh, of, of system that you're going through with your technology development, with the build out of uh, your sort of TRL levels and, and bringing up the scale. And seeing also the fact that you have, you know, sort of um, the, the support uh, through sort of funding to be able to, to facilitate that. Mm. So, mm. Well, well, the first question I'll ask is just, um, you know, how have you found sort of, I guess, uh, the, the innovation funding for, uh, for you know, sort of the development of, 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 the, of the device and, and, and the Palm uh, mm. sort of connector? Has it been a, a good, fruitful sort of journey? It's been absolutely brilliant, uh, John. Uh, Wave Energy Scotland, especially. They, um, <clears throat> first of all, this wouldn't have happened unless we'd had conversations with them at the early stages. And uh, it's funny how doors open because we're doing a bit of work here and a bit of work there. And maybe someone had a conversation with someone else and said, maybe you should have a chat with these guys. And, and next thing you know, you've got a chance to compete. Um, but Wave Energy Scotland's funding was uh, invaluable, and it was it was progressive in that uh, the first budget was a tenth of the final budget. Uh, so you, you you as confidence built and you went down the down, down the track, you got you got more sponsorship. Um, but the thing I, I really like about the Wave Energy Scotland program is the, the structure that they gave you. They the application form was enormous, and the the documentation was enormous, and so you you lose quite a lot of. Uh, life minutes working your way through that uh, but actually you're being educated as you go and uh, the, the, the things they were asking us to do are absolutely what we will do for the next product development that we do uh, so 
it's just you never never put it together. It's almost like a procedure, and uh, and that that's where it's been really helpful. I think is just just guiding us through that because we're an engineering design com- and analysis company. We're not really product developers, but lo and behold, we got a product, and we got an appetite for more products. So from that point of view, it's maybe stimulated something in the industry that wouldn't have otherwise uh, happened. But we also had mentoring uh, all the way through, so you know monthly mentor uh, meetings with our. Uh, our mentor um uh, so it, we, it just kind of took us through um the different stages he would help us resolve issues and so on and just keep us keep us uh, an eye on us and just just are we getting what we're getting and right now it's it's a great conversation because they're sort of facilitating conversations with other parties and saying well maybe this is where the crosstalk can happen you know offshore wind growth partnership was also pretty useful that was uh it was it was much more flexible much more open and a bit more hands-off uh, but they just basically said it's it's a good idea, go with it, you know. And that has led us to the point where we're now looking at floating offshore wind. Uh, a lot of the competitions now are saying, "Great, we'll uh, we'll give you fifty percent of the funding." And that's that's quite hard for a company like us to to cover the other fifty percent. So you you need to find other sponsorship and so on. But uh, I, I think it's been yeah, I've got a very positive feeling about uh, about that whole ex- whole experience. No, that's good. Well, where, where we are now, we've completed that, if you like, and it's up to us to get commercial. And that mm-hmm. means we need to present uh, our ideas in a way that is attractive to investors, basically investors or developers or stakeholders in some fashion. They say, well, OK, we'll take that one and uh, we'll work on this together going to the next stage. That, that's where we're at now. So, No, no, and that's, that's brilliant. I think really that's that's the way the system should work. You know, what you should be able to do is basically be able to get you to the point where you're you're getting to, to sort of a, a pre-commercial stage, or just just about commercial, and uh, and then you're you know you're, you're given the wings to fly, you know. So I think mm. that's I think that's a, that's, a, that's a great opportunity, and it's great to see that you have that positive experience from the from the work that you've been doing as well. Um, yeah. So some of the questions have been coming through, and again, guys, keep them coming. If, if there's anything else, we've got loads here, but we'll we'll keep Nigel on for as long as as, as we can. Uh, so one of the first questions that came through is. Um, what are the operations and maintenance uh, intervals for offshore wind turbines in terms of the need to take them off station? So I guess we we'll probably think of that. You know, I, I, I guess that question is kind of looking at the the the, the use the, the the use disconnect and reconnect of the of the systems. So the 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 duration between them, and uh, so from what you're expecting, you you kind of see what's happening in Cardin and there's quick mm. turbines and some of their their mm. assets. Um, so yeah, that I, was after a year they had to have an intervention, didn't they? Something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's not something. Design? Sorry, so was that a part of the design you looked at about what sort of what the, the predicted you know sort of regular uh, disconnect and reconnection of the of the holes would be? Yeah, um, it's it was just pretty broad brush uh, assumptions that we were doing at that stage, John. Um, so we we know that uh, say in floating uh, wind, uh, sorry, in fixed wind, uh, there's. There's warranty periods of 10 to 15 years or so where the the turbine uh, provider will will just sort out the the intervention and I don't know don't know how often they're wanting to go out and have a look at all that uh, I, I guess we were just kind of way taking a fairly broad brush uh, every every you'd want to get to the point where every five years you're doing some kind of inspection um, if it, even if it's a case of bringing the hull back in for a hull you know like a, a hull cycle inspection um, you know NSPS or something like that uh, working off that but then also saying there's possibly going to be un- unscheduled uh, interventions for one reason or another. So, uh, yeah, I did, it was basically, I don't know what the, defini- what the industry is saying about it, but we were working off the assumption that this is, it's a, it's a marine hull. You're going to follow pretty similar marine uh, procedures to, say, a, a rig, you know. Which I think makes sense. And um, yeah. I think having that ability for that sort of quick disconnect ability, even if it's, uh, you know, sort of... Um, for, for a quick turnaround, kind of, mm. kind of really makes sense. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> we also had another question, and we kind of touched on this, but I guess let's see if there's any other areas we want to expand into. Uh, so I haven't talked about the wave and wind projects. Uh, where is the PAMS uh, target market? Is, is there a specific area that you see it? And, and where do you see it maybe growing into as well? Is there any thoughts you've had on that? We got loads of thoughts, and I guess uh, part of it is to try and stay, stay focused. Like we've turned this thing upside down and turned it into a lifting device. Uh, it's an anchor. It's it's uh, lots of different things, but um, I mean the, the whole thing started with wave energy, and uh, wave energy could read marine energy. If anything, it's a floating uh, device. Uh, that's that's the whole market, if you like, for the PAM. Uh, it's it's a 
it's a limited sort of size, if you like, in that it's an early stage for a lot of projects. They may be doing one at a time, or a couple at a time. Uh, the prize is to be ready for floating offshore wind, uh, which is going to be vast by comparison, based on current levels of technology. Hopefully, marine energy will move up the the curve pretty quickly and start to start to uh, scale up. But um, what? Uh, so they're the two markets I'm most interested in. Uh, you can imagine others like floating fish farms or actually anything where you need to quickly tether something on and possibly tether with an electrical connection. It's talking about recharging of vessels uh, uh, off, uh, you know, floating stations or something like that. So we're looking, we're thinking about all that, but really it's, uh, it's to go after those two core areas. And, and the attractiveness of the marine energy one is that that's got the harshest environment by scale compared to the scale of the device. So if you can make it work for marine energy, you've learned so much that would give you the credibility for the larger scale floating offshore wind. And the marine energy devices are a bit smaller. So um, uh, the first place is to make it work for marine energy. And then uh, but floating offshore wind is very much in sights and it is the big prize. You know, it, 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 what a dream if we can make this work for floating offshore wind hulls by 20, last, second half of the decade. Well, absolutely. When you look at the amount of, you know, sort of uh, those type of floating projects that are, that are coming along, then, you know, the, the potential marketplace is huge, you know, mm-hmm. so and I guess one of the things I wanted to double check, and maybe I missed it during the during the presentation, but when you're doing the the testing itself, uh, were you testing the physical uh, connection, the electrical connection as well? So run the signal to, to check the continuity. No, we as, as I say, we um, we chose to just do dummy electrical connections. So there was no light bulb, if you like, <laughs> uh, because we just we the, the the innovation is all around the mechanical device to bring together someone else's electrical connectors. So if the electrical connector, and don't forget, you also need uh, the control lines in there. You need the fiber optics as well. Yep. That's been a bit of an assumption, but it is very much on the next stage that uh, when we do this extended test, what we really want to do is have some kind of electrical circuit uh, that demonstrate that that is working and, and possibly a fiber optic. Um, but uh, yeah, it was because it's not the innovation, that's not what we, what we focused on today, but it's an essential part of the whole thing being proven. So I think I'd be much more comfortable working with 12 volt batteries than 12, uh, you know, <laughs> 66 kilovolts, but uh, we'll get there. Yeah, but, but again, it's a stage process, isn't it? So it's basically kind of uh, softly, softly going through the stages. And like you say, yeah. during the presentation, you, you really demonstrated it as you're taking it through those TRL levels. So it's really kind of the next, uh, the, the next really kind of opportunity. and uh, next. Yeah, step definitely, forward. yeah. But we do have a good, a really interesting prospect of doing a, at this extended trial and just floating it off uh, some kind of buoy and leave it in a, a location for a period of months. Go back in every month, check that it connects, disconnects, just look what uh, how many lobsters have taken up residence in the receptacle, that kind of stuff, and what we're going to do about it. So. Absolutely. And um, okay, so there's a there's another question here with regards to uh, so sort of the clump weight. So I think you, you touched on one point that uh, that there was a clump weight uh, used uh, for the trials to simulate the mooring weight. Uh, how heavy was it in relation to the load capacity of the connector? Uh, on the the test was twenty tons, and the design the design that we've been working with is sized for the Motion Energy Blue X. It was our primary test case in stage two, so it was logical to work with that. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, the the design load there was twenty five tons. We worked off twenty tons. We figured it was pretty close. Um, yeah, the 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 strength connection is not the the biggest. The trickiest thing in this it's uh yeah there's a lot of steel compared to what you're doing at the moment mm-hmm. um i think when you get up to proper industrial scale um stress and strength will be a much more of an issue but uh, that is relatively comfort comfortable at this sk- stage uh it's much more about the tolerances and the positioning and the following the track and, and getting things into the locations that you want them in Right. No, no, I think that's, um, again, very, very valid point, really. Hmm. And, um, okay, no, but so, it's important. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important aspect, definitely. Well, at the end of the day, this thing has to be certifiable. Uh, it has to yep. be, uh, you know, uh, you, we, we would like to get um, a certification authority to have a, be part of the next stage. Um, hmm. And uh, we, we're sort of in touch with some of them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so all that... There'll be proof tests, there'll be load tests, all that stuff is essential. So it's absolutely it's absolutely what it needs. Uh, we just haven't got onto anything more than what we've done up to uh, that 20-ton test so far. 
Got you, got you. No, absolutely. And uh, <clears throat> I suppose you, you must be, you know, once you got this level of testing done, you know, so there must be a lot of interest and activity now coming from uh, these sort of developers, particularly in the floating wind, when you're, you know, so they're, try, they're trying to look at these optimized solutions. And it, it's, you know, I guess there's a potential sweet spot right now because there's a lot of demonstrator type projects that have been looked at that are trying to, you know, sort of not fault find, but, but stress test these sort of uh, different innovations in order to mm-hmm. create that, you know, sort of ultimate floating solution. So really, I guess the you know, so as you're moving on to these next stages, then you're seeing the opportunity now where these projects can really kind of, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, present themselves. Yeah, well, it's still, the initiative is still very much with us. Uh, we see a lot of genuine interest from whoever we present this to. Uh, but uh, it's up to us to push and say, we've got a solution here. Uh, do, you, do you need it? Um, I think there are in, innovation uh, innovation teams and developers, which uh, is what we really want, are into innovation responsible persons. Uh, that's where we want to be talking and and get. As I say, we need a stepping stone project to to get to um, show that this works at quite large scale on a project. Uh, that is the next step. So, quite a few conversations on the go. There's a lot of marketing you have to do. There's a lot of uh, a lot of the a lot of talks. There's a lot of uh, going to. Uh, off season and just explaining what it is but generally it's it's pretty positive i would say i think uh, i think people like the fact that this is it's no nonsense keeps the vessel down nothing fancy in terms of servos whatever it's uh, it's agricultural in one level but it does quite a subtle thing so um that that gives it its usp uh, so we do get we're getting good traction on that watch your space i think John. <laughs> yeah, it's like well, they say you got you got to kiss a lot of frogs before you find your prince. You know, yeah, so. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So, uh, to me, Chris, I, I, I'm going to apologize to you, Joe. Sure, my screen, so for for people watching, uh, you got we got three, um, you know, sort of screens here, and I had the screens down the bottom, so I couldn't see you. So, so my, my, my apologies. So I actually, I, I was messaging the back chat saying, are, are, are you still here, Chris? And then I realized I just basically had you below my my uh, my, my screen. Uh, so is there any questions that you have, uh, Chris, do you want to jump in rather than me just real road in the conversation? <laughs> no, th- thanks, John. Uh, no, I'm quite happy to, to let uh, let the conversation flow. Um, uh, thanks, Nigel, for the, the really excellent presentation. Um, good to see the sort of um, progress from early concept through to design and, and um Sea trials. It's uh, it, it's it's an excellent sort of um, history of the project, and I'd say great to see Aberdeen South Harbour being being used for the first time. To, to yeah. it. it's really really cool to see that. We were there in, <laughs> in action. Um, yeah, I think I think we've to be honest, I've covered um, a great deal of the questions um, in the conversation so far. One one thing uh, jumping out, I think, which is still to be answered, is um, to do with uh, geographically. Is this um, do you see this as sort of dedicated to, to the UK? Um, industry or do you, do you anticipate sort of a wider um, global um, market? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, that's really just a, a business decision. I think this, if it, wherever you're doing floating offshore wind, wherever you're doing marine energy, um, that's where it could work in principle. Have we the wherewithal to pile into Taiwan and go selling there? Not at the moment. So uh, we're selling to the home market. That's that's where we see see this uh, working. So it, uh, yeah, Celtic Sea actually is is an area that's uh, opened up as a possibility over the last few months. Uh, so up to now, I was always thinking in terms of Scotland because we're in Aberdeen, Edinburgh, etc. Um, but so we think Central Belt kind of developers has been the key target, uh, and, and yourselves, of course, uh, but other marine energy developers. But uh, yeah, down in Southwest uh, England and Wales, that's opening up. Uh, but we're sticking very much to UKCS. Uh, but uh, yeah, in principle, anywhere where they're doing floating offshore wind, so Japan, Taiwan, America, I have I have hopes that this will this will fund my around the world travel one day. Yeah, certainly would. Um, did do you see uh, any sort of I guess limitations in terms of ge- geographically in terms of, for example, water depth? Do, do you think there's a sort of um, a particular um, area of interest or perhaps where it's, it's less practical to use this device? Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I mean, you, it's based around the idea of a mooring, isn't it? So there is a limit to, to when moorings uh, stop, stop being useful, but we're talking like 1,000 thousand, thousand metres uh, once you've got fibre ropes in there. So um, 
uh, super deep water, no, is not going to be suitable for that, I don't think. I th but I think it, would, it will follow the technology. It's, it's really an enabling technology for power generation. So where the power generators are working, that's where we want to go. We haven't found anything which we've investigated that says we can't, we can't make this work. So like so the Carnegie, Carnegie Energy device, that is a, um, that's a large-scale submerged device. Uh, so a, a very different configuration. We found a way of putting this to work. So um, is there a too shallow? Uh, I suppose there comes a point where the whipping and uh, the, the whipping action could be an issue uh, if you get a lot of dynamics uh, and then you, you could just drop the plug out of the receptacle because it relies on having a positive tension. So you've got to design out the, the snatch loading. Um, so the, the, you can imagine high wave energy, shallow water locations not being particularly good for this. Uh, I, but then you, you probably want to go for something fixed bottom around there anyhow. So uh, yeah, it did. I haven't found a limit uh, other than the fact that moving will stop at some point. But to be honest, that's so far down the line at the moment, I think the target market is the, the 70 metre, 100 metre kind of water depths that uh, Floating Offshore Wind is looking at. Yeah, uh, absolutely. There's a huge market that's already there, isn't there? So, mm. um, thank you very much. Um, folks, I think we've um, concluded all the questions, uh, unless any have come through in the last few minutes. Um, so, uh, John, do you have any, any further comments or questions to... Uh, yeah, I guess I'm uh, uh, looking through sort of the notes that I was making as I was going through. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what the next evolution of the design is going to be. You know, this um, obviously you're going to be you know sort of building up the, the sort of the scale of it for the different sizes and the different types of loads. You mm -hmm. mentioned 3D printing and how you probably look at different solutions in that respect. I suppose there'll be like you know uh, cathodic protection and anodes and then sensoring, all these sort of things that, that can come into. Yeah. understand what the next stage look like so i, I guess <clears throat> one final question for me is like um is there is there anything in particular that became very apparent uh that you kind of went actually this is something that's that, that that's needed or necessary uh that we didn't originally envisage if, there, if it's a big one thing you know that's easy enough to do yeah i think it was the fact it was that bit about going uh the di direction reversal uh that we go up and then come back down that way because of the torsion uh so um we are. We want to do a specific design study about what's the optimal track shape for this. So the track, track shape was drawn ages ago, and uh, and we just sort of took it from geographic, sorry, geometrical principles and said if we did that and then you drop it down, it falls into that place. That's fine, but that could be more, much subtler. I just think that that would be there. You, there might be lips or there might be not, uh, notches or whatever that just ensures it goes one way. And that's one thing we'd like to look at. Or do we need something that's a little bit springy and keeps it rotating in the same direction? Uh, so that was that's that was the toughest challenge that we had during the test, I would say, is just mm -hmm. to overcome that. We did overcome it. Um, oh, in relation to that, you're relying on subsea swivels. Uh, so what is the long-term performance of a subsea swivel? And what if that's got an electrical component in it as well? So it, we're told that you, you get these, these components, uh, but maybe, maybe they won't be quite so soft after a period of time. So we have to design against that. So that is a specific thing on the design risk register that we are uh, going to focus on in the, the next evolution. But quite convinced it's a, a solvable or, or a designable solution. Uh, but that is, that, that's the one area. Brilliant. No, I think that's, that's great. I think it's you're 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 learning every single time. I think that's absolutely that, that's the most important thing. And uh, and you know, you're, it's that evolution of the of the product itself. Yeah, so, yeah. it's been that's, an education. That's, <laughs> well, yeah, uh, that's, that's all. That's all the questions that I have. Oh yeah, uh, that and uh, yeah, the, the other thing would be that ball of fury, like really, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, having a good rigger, having a good rigger who's yeah, pushes your dreams. And you mentioned about the about the uh, the shackle that you know. Oh, that blooming that, that's a cost of fortune. This thing flew it up from Southampton on the day just to get it to work, and it goes, nah, I don't want that. And, and, and if you're anything like me, and what I'm guessing is that it broke your heart because I guess whoever it was, whatever engineer the rigger sold, they probably looked at them like they're like from a different planet and said. Yeah. Not using that, probably. Yeah, mind you. In all fairness, when I took it out of the DHL package, I went, 
oh my god, it's about <laughs> half the size I thought it was going to be. But it's it's a really good fidgety thing on your desk, you know. Instead of who needs fidget spinners, uh, fidget spinners when you got something like this, you know. There you go. <laughs> this is good for ADHD. All right. so. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or too much coffee. Brilliant. Okay. Okay. Well, um, thank you, uh, thank you, Nigel, for the for the presentation. Uh, really. Really excellent presentation. Thank you again, and um, thanks to everyone who's um, who's taken part. Um, thanks to the audience, and and for those of you who who posted questions, it's good to have this um, this sort of interaction at the end of the, the webinar. Yeah. Well, thanks so, everyone for for listening. Um, please do look out uh, for the next Aberdeen Maritime Branch webinar, which um, will appear on the IMRS website quite soon. Uh, I believe it's scheduled for the nineteenth October, and it's on unmanned search and rescue uh, vessels. So from all of us uh, at Aberdeen... Is that Master, Zealand? Uh, that's right, yes. Ah, yes. yeah, fantastic. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, please do look out for that. And from all of us at Aberdeen Maritime Branch, thank you and good evening. Good night.